Oh no. No. I think we should I think we should start without them. Yeah. So okay. we uh, so all right. So what I I started by just running an example from the This is from the aircraft dynamics library from a company called Model. You're, we're, you see a little simulation there of a, of a landing of a plane. Uh, Megan is going to show you some examples later on today, but it just was just to entertain you a little bit. Uh, the model at the top layer, you see, it looks quite simple, but as you begin in what you actually have, uh, you start expanding views and representations. So the idea today is kind of like to give you an introduction on, uh, well, the, the presentation is really general today. It's about how we could use uh, Modelica and the FMI standards um, for, for Cheetah. And I'm going to go first through some slides on general things about modern and simulation, uh, and then why these open access standards that we're using are are used are, are useful, and also why they are important. And I can also tell you a little bit about why this is relevant from the point of view of industry. And then the rest of the time, uh, Megan is going to show you some examples from this library. Uh, there's many libraries and many examples that we can show you also of the of the other stuff, but we thought that uh, we had some students from freelance, but maybe we don't, but at least it gives you an idea. Um, and we will show you why we think it's relevant to use this kind of stuff. And um, so that's today. And then the next day, what we're going to do is show you more specific examples that we are building. So one thing that we're doing to to kind of be able to illustrate the whole process of multi-domain modeling and, um, and how, how that could be tied in also into comparing with an uh, actual prototype. Uh, we have set up a small drone test bed and we are doing all the models of the drone for each of the electrical and the uh, aero part. And then we are uh, doing experiments on it and comparing it to a model. So we'll show you where we are at with that as an example of how we think that we can do some things for Cheetah. A more specific example is the, the model that we're developing as a, a, what is a baseline uh, the, for the electrical system for the Boeing 747 in this platform. So. Uh, that example is going to show you, so the first example it aims to show you some special concepts of the Modelica language that is interface, multiple domains, how do you use equations without having to go on, uh, derive the block diagrams and so on. And the Boeing example is really showing more advanced concepts of the language uh, that allows you to create uh, templates of architectures and how you can use a template and architecture to reconfigure different types of models. And so, uh, and finally, we're going to show you, uh, Professor Haran set up some notional power system. So we started building uh, a simulation model for that, for one part of it. So we, we, we want to show you what we got. So that's next uh, Friday. So today, really just to serve you as an introduction so you can understand a little bit better what we're doing ourselves in the project and to give you an idea at least where things fit in. Is there any questions about the plan? Uh, before any questions, actually, what I'm going to do is to share in the chat these slides in case you want to download them and make a copy or make a copy, um, take your notes. You can have access for, for it already. Somebody okay. else just joined. Oh. Yeah. Tipa? Yeah. All right. So, Tipa, we just went through the plan. So, today we're going to do an introduction, go through some hands on examples from 
from like a professional library and next we will go through the work that we're doing as a way to motivate why this is useful all right thank you thank you yeah so that's the, the only thing that we covered so far we were waiting all right so um thank you very much. if you if you want to take notes and so on there's a link now in the chat for my slides you can duplicate them by going to file um, file i think oh you can do where make a it? copy where is the copy make a copy, copy. and then if you want to take your own copy to take notes that that's fine with me i don't care all right so uh, before we start going into any details of the language i often like to go through these few slides that i use for teaching or um, mostly anything that uh, when I am introducing why we use Modelica, right? So uh, that's where we're going to start right now. Let me put that chat box here. So uh, just, um, I, I'm sure that you all know these things somehow, but I just want to um, uh, give a common ground for what we're doing. So these this, uh, concepts, these are general concepts, so everybody probably understands what is a system. So a system can be a space shuttle, it can be a tank, or it can be a power system. And the idea is that we, how we make models, or how we develop models, is that uh, we realize that it contains subsystems that themselves are systems. So, for example, in a power system, we have electrical generators, but those generators or power plants are subsystems that include different control systems, protections, the electrical machine, and so on. So uh, when we talk about systems from the perspective of uh, object-oriented modeling, uh, we talk about a system as an object or a collection of objects uh, whose properties we are of interest in. And we want to uh, study some of the properties of those objects. So there is uh, two reasons to do that. Uh, we want to understand it in order to build it, and that's the case of uh, Cheetah. Uh, it's an engineering point of view, or to satisfy human curiosity, so we need to understand more. So here's a big system. Everybody has seen this picture, so if you haven't seen it, it's just a picture of uh, of the U.S. Uh, power grid uh, in the in the night, right? And if you zoom in, here is New York City, and that's Long Island. So uh, you can see how it's easy, very easy to see through the illumination uh, how interconnected the system is, and where you have subsystems. Right? So uh, this is um, this is Long Island, and the reason I put this picture is that we're over here right in Albany, uh, close to Albany. So you see there's points here. This is Albany, this Connecticut, and that's Troy, New York. So it's easy to tell from the picture. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have different types of systems. We have natural and artificial systems. Uh, system can occur naturally. Uh, that's the case of the universe or artificially. Uh, it's a special, um, but we often deal with a combination of both. So we have this example here, uh, the solar heater water system that you have here is artificial, while the clouds that are, uh, impact the performance of that system are natural, okay? And uh, this system has certain properties. So uh, the observability is the ability to take measurements of the system during the process, so, for example, we could measure the temperature of the water and maybe the sol solar irradiance. Uh, we can also influence the behavior of the system through certain inputs, and that's the controllability. Um, those inputs are variables of the environment that can influence the behavior of the system uh, directly. For example, we can control the pump. But some of them uh, cannot be controlled intentionally, right? So uh, there is limitations to what inputs we have access to. And the outputs are the variables that we can um, be determined and, inf uh, and influence the surrounding of the environment. 
tell us are simple things. So normally, if a, a system already exists, we would like to perform experiments in order to characterize it and understand it. But the problem is that uh, sometimes we don't have uh, inputs. They are not accessible. They may be, for example, one, one problem I have all the time is that those inputs to control something are inside of the control system and I can only change a reference, for example. Uh, you could also have uncontrollable inputs to the system, such as disturbances. Uh, also, there are many useful outputs that are not accessible for measurements, such as internal states or ways that we represent things. But largely, we don't do experiments because it's expensive, okay? And uh, you have to build a prototype and you can damage it. And uh, uh, you could all, it's also dangerous. Um, uh, for uh, the easiest example is training in nuclear operators, but it's also <laughs> uh, things can go wrong and you can blow up the entire thing. And in our case, the system doesn't exist, uh, and uh, ideally someday we're going to build it. Uh, if we do, I'm not getting on it, uh, but Megan is already volunteered for that. Well, I volunteered you, so. <laughs> I'm not. Um, so a model of the system will allow us to investigate these kind of questions uh, only if the model is realistic enough. So, uh, so I'll, what, what is a model then? Is, uh, does anybody want to guess what it says here? Where is that? You can uh, unmute yourself if you want to. Um, something about uh, pro it's proportional to, like the model is proportional to the real life system. Nobody knows this? So this is Newton's second law. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so force is equal to mass times acceleration. That's what it says. In Newton's time, they didn't write equations. They wrote in Latin. So that's the model of, of uh, gravity that we have, right? Of uh, Newtonian uh, uh, dynamics. So as you see, the model is anything an experiment can be applied to so that we can answer questions of what we're trying to mock, what we're trying to mimic. Without doing experiments in the real system, what you do is that you do simplify, simplified experiments on the model. So in reality, what we have when we have models is that we have a simplified view of reality, okay? So, and I put this equation over here, um, this equation, this statement over here, because that's the model and that's how we used to develop models. So you can have a verbal model that is a statement, and you can, you're, for example, a person, uh, Haran, uh, Professor Haran is very reliable, that's trying to model the person's behavior. I don't know how accurate my uh, model of Professor Haran is right now because he didn't come to the web call. <laughs> so you can tell how I'm, I'm joking. Uh, so this is this is also a variable model. Uh, anybody can tell me what it is this model that we have over here? What kind of type of model is it? Nobody? It's a physical model. Exactly, it's a physical model. So we build a mock version, a small one, and we perform experiments on it to try to reproduce some things. And finally, the things that we're interested in, mostly in research, is to write physical models. So we want a description of the system where the relationships between the variables of the system are explained in some mathematical form. Okay, so that's just you know, now mathematical models have been developed from physical principles, from the laws of nature, uh, uh, from experiments and observations. 
and they are understood by humans. So mo uh, mathematical models are really the knowledge that we develop of how something behaves. Unfortunately, the model knowledge is stored in books uh, where equations and text are in natural language. So here's a very nice model of uh, gas turbine where, where I'm highlighting the th thermodynamic process of it. So they are in books and they're in our heads because we kind of understand certain things, right? However, uh, computers have a difficulty to access uh, this knowledge or uniquely, inter um, but more importantly, to interpret it with uniqueness, right? This is changing with natural language, uh, um, yeah, natural language processing, but still we have a, a difficulty into translating what we understand and writing equations to how a computer can understand it. So we use equations to do that. If you didn't know, the first forms of these equations were used in 1000 BC, but the first attempt on solving a first order equation was done in 1620, 50 BC. The equality sign was not used until 1557 by Robert, Robert Record. And as you saw before, Newton wrote that uh, change is proportional to the motive force impressed, that's or Newton's equation. So up until then, we never really had to deal with equations other than uh, to be understood by humans. But when computers came out, uh, it was until 1967 that CSSL, a uh, programming language, introduced a form of an equation where you define a variable equal to an expression. So this is what everybody's used to. So here you have uh, um, force divided by mass is equal to velocity. So if you realize it, uh, what is going on is that programming languages actually do not allow you to use equations, but you have to create what is called an assignment statement. So you're assigning here that V is going to be equal to F over M. And that's explicit. The programmer or you are doing that yourself. And this is the main difference of the Modelica language with any other language, is that Modelica allows you to define the equations casually. So the direction doesn't, should not matter. So you don't have to make an assignment statement. So you could write that uh, F is equal to times N, uh, uh, is equal to M times V, and the Modelica tool that is using that language has to figure out which is the correct form of the expression that needs to be solved. So that's one, one of the things that are very different. And the other thing that is very different is that the language is object-oriented for modeling. So it uses equations and object orientation to, the, to define how the system uh, is assembled. And it's a standard. It's a standard. So what means is that the uh, how the language syntax is developed is standardized, and in the case of uh, Modelica, it's an open access standard. That means that you don't have to go through a paywall, such as IEEE, to have the document. And it's also open source, which means that the language definition and uh, some of the associated building blocks are available as open source. Before we go into more details of Modelica, uh, let me try to uh, wrap up my, my introduction. So uh, we represent systems in two different ways. One is equations and functions, and the other one is computer programs, OK? Which, in, in traditionally co or co conventionally, we translate those equations and functions into a simulation artifact uh, which is called a virtual prototype. So simulation is actually from Latin simulare, which means to, to pretend. So we perform experiments on this 
a virtual prototype model. We, um, we may not need to have the model in mathematical form, but that's what we need for what we are doing. Uh, so the value of these simulations that we do is completely dependent on how good the representation is and uh, regarding the questions that we want to ask. Right now, there is something called the virtual vehicle architecture that they're developing where you're going, to, what they're trying to do in the autom automotive domain is to put as much as you can as a virtual prototype to minimize the time that you have to develop a new uh, vehicle. However, uh, you always have to remember that any model cannot be accepted as the final or true definite description of an actual cyber physical system of this type or any, any kind of system. Any model will have eventually some drawbacks and limitations which brings me to the last slide of the introduction about the dangers of uh, models and simulations. So the most common one that I face with all my power engineering friends is the Pygmalion effect, uh, where people fall in love with their model. And in most, in most areas of engineering where it, there is very domain specific tools that are only used by that group of people, they fall in love in the tool. Uh, this effect means that you forget the, that the model is not the real world. And it comes from the myth of uh, Pygmalion, which was a sculptor that fell in love with the statue that he had carved. So he made the statue from a model. So instead of falling, in, uh, uh, sorry, from, from an actual person. So instead of falling in love with the person, he fought, fought, fell in love with the representation of that person. So that's a big danger. Uh, the other uh, typical problem is to force reality into the constraints of the model. Um, so this is called the protusis uh, effect. It's very popular in economic theories. Uh, protusis, uh, it was a rogue smith. Um, and basically what he used to do is that he would either put you in a protusian bed uh, it was a bed made out of uh, um, a specific size. And if you do, didn't fit in it, he will stretch you until you fit or he will cut your legs. And this is uh, the way that arbitrary standards are trying to enforce certain conformity. So the idea here is that you have specific models for every uh, standardized models for to represent all potential planes, but maybe your plane is special or maybe your induction machine is special and you can't force it. It doesn't fit into certain part of those equations. So that's, that's uh, another danger that we have. And the other thing is that forgetting the models of uh, uh, ability to represent reality has a limitation on how much you can represent it. So you can have simple models that can only help you in steady state, other models that can help you uh, steady state and dynamics, but maybe you have a range of a bandwidth that is, is not possible to represent and you forget it. And if you forget it, then you start making incorrect computations or and so on. Okay, so the at the end, we covered all of this, but there is a fundamental question is why do we develop these models of uh, cyber and physical systems? Uh, anybody? Well, I guess you can guess what this is, right? This is um, a model of a plane. Uh, it was um, during First World War. Uh, the pilot will sat, sat on top of it and it will try to stabilize with a reference bar. Uh, this was a really poor model of the plane because 42% of the British pilots uh, who died in World War I training with this kind of prototypes died during training. So that's kind of the importance of developing good models and simulation. Uh, but in general, we try to reduce lifetime cost of a system so we can start by uh, when we do the 
the requirements as we're doing for this project. We need to do trade-off studies. So we need a model to know how to size, dimension, um, uh, choose a particle control algorithm, etc. Uh, to test and design in order to build fewer prototypes. So the more we can do in simulation, the least that we have to do in the lab, uh, and therefore reduce cost. Uh, as the example here shows, this is to avoid uh, the cost of human life and accidents. So in training, uh, especially in the aerospace field, simulate uh, models and simulation are really important. And finally, when you're operating the system, you need to anticipate problems. So using a model of the system, you can try to do what if scenarios to see what will happen in the future. And all of this is covered in the uh, what is called the Model V development approach for model-based systems engineering. There is a gazillion type of Model V pictures. Uh, I illustrated here basically for uh, developing a new control system for a wind turbine. So you will start with some requirements. Um, you know, it, you must uh, respond in this way. For example, in the wind industry, they have something called um, fault right through requirements that they give you the shape of the response, the boundaries of how you should respond. And then you have to check that your, mo uh, your model will respond like that. So those are kind of requirements that you can check over specifications. So you use different type of models at this level, which are usually uh, in uh, high level architectures and uh, using unified modeling language. But over here, in general, we start using simulation models. And once you have a good system level specification, you actually do device models, for example, the easiest one is the controls compared to everything else, uh, where you will implement it and prototype it. So the point of the V here is that when you arrive to this stage or at any stage when the system exists, you can start to test against your design and incrementally improvement. So instead of having a single V, you start going into like having many Vs connected to each other. So you can have a W or you can have multiple Ws connected to each other, doing all of this testing all the way to operation. All right. So is a, um, one of the best examples of this is how uh, Boeing manufactures planes. If you haven't seen this magazine, it's, uh, it's an issue called simulating success, which uh, Boeing describes how they use different uh, methods and tools to uh, do modern and simulation. So, of course, they do this product uh, and system testing, training, uh, and the increasing importance of uh, model uh, of communication. So, they use uh, modern and simulation to test prototypes. They also use uh, modeling and simulation to uh, train users. They say that they save ten times the cost of actually uh, doing the scenarios in in the physical world. Uh, for networking, uh, they have um, there is very cost prohibitive to do uh, in-flight uh, communication, so they do all of this in the lab. Uh, the other aspect of uh, uh, modeling and simulation in today's world is that you need to do this collaboratively. You need to do it with many people, uh, geographically spread over it, across a continent like the North North American continent or even across the world. So you have all these uh, suppliers that need to build a plane, so they need models for each of that thing. And the last thing is that uh, you might not know, but I mean, uh, now you all know because you're in this project, uh, you, in a plane you have basically a flying microgrid. Uh, and that has its own challenges itself. All right, so this is the first part to the introduction. Now I'm going to talk about open standards, that which is Modelica. Is there any questions about the first part? Okay, I take it you have no questions. I keep going. All right. So uh, when doing modeling and simulation, we have certain difficulties with respect to uh, specific tools. Um, so 
the general approach that we learn on how we should actually solve uh, problems using um, uh, models is that we have a physical system and we try to uh, understand it uh, by first principles or we look at some measurements and we formulate the models based on certain hypotheses. Then we may need to make certain simplifications to derive the equations that we're going to use. And to solve these equations, we need to choose an appropriate numerical method uh, because it's very unlikely that we can solve most of today's engineering problems in closed form. So when you have the general approach, you have a duality between the user uh, oh, sorry, the, the user undergoes a duality. So the user is both a modeler and an analyst, okay? So it has the ability to understand the entire process and the ability to uh, modify parts of it. So in today's tools that we use for modeling simulation engineering, unfortunately, this uh, dichotomy is broken. And you have a modeler that is familiar with a specific platform and an, analy an analyst. Uh, so this modeler is familiar with it and is able to make changes, but is separated from the user that become, becomes a specialized analyst that is familiar with this platform. And so somebody decides what the physical equation should be and so on. And some, that somebody will decide on what is the hypothesis. And then what you do is that you propose a model which is interlaced, okay? It, it, it's uh, written in such way that the simplifications and the numerical method are together like your shoestrings. And when that, those choices are made, also has a limitation on the number of solvers that you can use, okay? So this is uh, a great uh, disadvantage that object-oriented modeling simulation is trying to uh, uh, solve. So that's, that's uh, 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 these characteristics is making the industry, certain industries going, uh, moving out of um, proprietary uh, languages to uh, open standard-based uh, languages. So this is, um, um, study from VDC Research is one of these companies that, that make a living out of making surveys and, and uh, they don't do research, you know. <laughs> but uh, they came out with this report and on the left-hand side you have the, this is from 2015 where I had access to this report. I'm not paying them for it again. <laughs> so here, uh, here you have the, the entire uh, manufacturing industry, so from making tanks and planes to making uh, tools. And this is specific for the automotive industry that is kind of like the bleeding edge of uh, developing this open standard. So you see that the question was, um, uh, in the current and um, future projects, uh, what are you gonna use, standard languages or uh, proprietary languages? And um, so you can see here the trend that they are in the current project, they're increasing their use in um, uh, standard based languages versus proprietary languages, which are uh, decreasing. So proprietary languages are those such as MATLAB, Simulink, which most people in academia is familiar with, but you have a bunch of families of standardized languages. Uh, I, we have the pleasure to work with something called PSSC and PSCAD, which are not languages, they're not even languages, they're tools, so they don't even have, uh, well, they, you know, she has to suffer with those things all the time. Okay, so the, the point here is that this has a reason because uh, when the tools that we are accustomed to in, in certain industries were developed, they were done to, to, to deal with certain use cases. And they were also um, done uh, with the mentality of usually the 1970s and 80s, where computers started to be available and they had certain limitations. Uh, they were also used to simplify software development and to create some documentation. 
However, uh, with the changes that we're seeing in computer technology, in uh, in the energy area, especially with the integration of power electronics, we're seeing that the existing tools are reaching the limitations of of um, that were imposed by the use case that were developed. So, uh, one big aspect that is is uh, continuously creating issues is that uh, we're inputting more and more computer technology in control systems, and we need to uh, both represent uh, the physics in the models, but we also need to somehow integrate the actual software running inside of the controllers. So this is this is the challenges that we're dealing with it now in the last five years at least. So the open, the Modelica and the FMI, which is the stands for Function Markup Interface, are open access standards that allow you to uh, solve model-based system engineering challenges. Um, here is an example for uh, vehicles, but basically. They allow you to start very early on with simplified models to do system-wide analysis, to optimize how you're designing the system based on first principle models, go and improve your design, and start developing very detailed models that allow you to create uh, more detailed subsystems based on those uh, simplifications that you made of the entire uh, system. It allows you to specify boundary conditions, and you can even generate code um, in some if you need it for controllers and things like that. So this is a picture of the uh, uh, Daimola. Daimola is not the only Modelica tool. There are a bunch of them. Uh, I will show you some of them. Uh, you know, there's one in your town, guys. It's called uh, uh, System Modeler. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately it's not as mature as the other ones, so that's why I'm not using it right now for this project. But I like it a lot. There's also Open Modelica. You know, open it up here, and they have to type for system model because yeah. So this is a little bit of magic actually, because until I found Modelica, into uh, well, until I started using Modelica. The idea that have been able to open and simulate the same model in in three different tools was something that couldn't exist in my mind. But effectively, what I'm doing here is I'm opening the, the an example in all of them, and not it, not only the the graphical representation is the same, but if you simulate with the same solvers. Well, here it's prettier because they have invested a lot of money making things pretty. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm running the simulations of all of these examples now. So not only can you actually simulate this, uh, um, sorry, not only can you have the same model in multiple tools, but you can also get the same simulation result, something that is unheard of in at least any of the power system tools that I use. Uh, you can never expect to have the same answer and to try just to, uh, uh, what is it called, open a model in a different tool. Well, you might be able to open the, uh, exchange the parameter window, but that's as much as you're gonna, you're gonna get, right? So, all right, now that's not a good variable to plot. That, why should I plot here? Ah, here is the speed. That's stupid. Speed sensor. So okay. So scale diagram. Plot variable. So the the there you go. So let me go on here. Uh, speed sensor plot variable. So you can see. Yeah, three tools, same language, same results. If you do the right choices. So that's a powerful, uh, powerful proposition when you have to work uh, in um, um, multidisciplinary projects. Now, how does this work? Well, this is possible because it leverages equation-based modeling. I already mentioned this before. So normal programming languages don't allow you for equations in any form. However, Equation-based modeling in the way that we do it in Modelica 
it defines an implicit, not explicit relationship with two variables. What that means is that you do not have to write the equation with an assignment statement. You write the equation as it's in the textbook. Okay, so let me uh, let me illustrate that with an example. So let's go here and let's look. Uh, let's see what's a good example. Ah, electrical, right? Or, let's see. So let, let's just look at the equations for the inductor, right? That's easy. So you see, there is our equation. Okay, I don't have to say voltage equal to, uh, sorry, I don't have to say that the derivative of phi is equal to V over L. That's not my problem. I just have to write the equations as they are in the textbook. As you can see here, uh, maybe you cannot see, I assume it. All right. Um, Maybe anybody has a, a suggestion for an example? This is much more complicated if I open this one. So you see here that this uh, model has uh, different characteristics. So let me come back. I showed you a simple one. I'll come back to more complicated construction soon. So, the ability of uh, not having to de declare everything with an assignment statement, or for example, to tell the direction where things are going, is called acacial modeling. I think it's like that. Well, whatever. Uh, so the system can be seen either as a complete model or a set of individual components. And the user, in principle, should only be concerned with model creation and doesn't have to deal with the simulation engine behind of it, okay? So uh, it al allows you to decompose a, a complex model in different sub-models that are shared here and reused. So here, let's go back to the example. So you here have models for each of these components, and as you see, here we have some control equations, but this is mechanical. So if you go here into the equations for the inertia, you have here the that uh, inertia times acceleration is equal to the difference between the the speed and the flanges. I think it's uh, what you're seeing here. But that can be connected to other components as you're uh, seeing here. So we're connected to a spring damper, and if you look into the equations of the spring damper. You have your linear relationship here with the coefficient of elasticity uh, called uh, the spring constant um, called C over here. So you, what is common between these two things is that they have a common interface which shares the equations uh, at the um, at the uh, where you couple them. And so if we go back into any of this, you can open these flanges. And the equations with, behind these flanges are uh, extend flange. Okay, so this is actually the object orientation. So in here, uh, what we are sharing is the variables. So we have a potential variable that is, in this case, is the angle, and a flow variable that is the torque. When you look at it into a circuit, you're going to have something called a pin, and the potential variable is going to be the voltage, and the current is going to be the flow. So that allows us to couple them together. All right, well, let me go to the next slide. So uh, moreover, you can do this graphically. So as you saw- I have a question. Yeah. Um, in terms of well, the speed of running, do, does the implicit, uh, does implicit modeling have the same speed as an explicit language? Uh, because it's uh, like uh, what to solve for? No, nah, it's not the same. So I, I have to explain some other things before we arrive to that. You will you will see what happens in the background. So we we have instead of just inputting parameters and running something, you have to actually generate code that then is executed. And that code will depend on your choice of which solver you will use. So it's uh, it's hard to answer that question directly, but I can come back to that uh, later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So something that you were seeing here is that you can actually that you had uh, object orientation. So basically, uh, here 
I'm going to zoom it in. We have a, a language word that's called extends. And extends allows us to take a base model. In here, we're using a model that has the interfaces of the flanges and allows us to inherit those flanges to create the inertia model. So if you look at this interfaces package over here, right, you have one that is called partial two flanges. And this one includes inside of it graphically. You see, this, there is an icon over here that graphically defines those, right? So graphically, so that means that somebody went and did drag and drop, it has graphically defined those interfaces and the inertia component is basically inheriting them. So that's how you start building up models based on object orientation, and you can do that graphically, okay? It's not only programmatically, but you can do graphical equation-based model. Uh, this is an example from our library where we build things like that. Uh, so the, the lines that you see here, those are composition lines that represent the connections between either um, uh, the components, and it also is described by uh, equations and by physical relationships. Okay, so basically what Modelica is, is a next generation modeling language. It allows you to declaratively, it's a declaratively statically typed language. So this is not like scripting. You actually have to compile and then run. Uh, but it allows you to do a, a casual modeling. So the reason, the reason that is uh, statically typed is that it, the the a modelica tool like any of the three I showed you has to analyze the equations and choose which ones to solve. Uh, after that is done, it has to generate. Oh, that's a reason I had that there like that. All right. Uh, uh, after that is done, um, um, it has to do uh, type checking and uh, so on. So. Uh, that's some of the, I mean, that's that's how it works. Uh, it allows you to do cyber physical and multi-domain modeling, so you can combine electrical models with mechanical models, with thermodynamic, with hydraulic, and so on, through interfaces that couple the domains. So the best example of this for electrical people is to look at a machine. So when you look at a machine here, we have here, the, uh, the induction machine, these ones are electrical AC interfaces, you see? Uh, so you have a positive and negative uh, terminals. And here, you're coupling to electrical components. This is, uh, uh, here, we have a model that is representing the relationship between the electrical circuits and the air gap. And the air gap is the one that is going to move the rotor, right? So this rod over here, as you see, it goes and it has mechanical connections. So those mechanical connections allows us to interface physically the electrical world with the mechanical world and provide a mechanical interface, OK? So here you have electrical, you have mechanical, and you have the thermal representation. So you can have the thermal circuit for the machine over here also, uh, so that you are also able to consider the heating. This is lumped models, okay? So the, the, the heating network also has to be uh, lumped equivalent uh, in this case, okay? All right, so um, uh, I have more examples later, you can also represent biological networks. You can do controls. You can represent events. You can do real time, etc. Uh, in this language, everything is a class. Uh, this allows uh, safe engineering practices uh, because you do sti statically type object orientation, and you have a general class concept such as in Java or if you do actually do object orientation in MATLAB, um, which most people I know don't do it, but that's it. 
Uh, you do have a visual component programming, as I showed you before. So you can create a system architecture and then modify inside. I will, we will show that more in detail with Megan in the second day. And this is efficient and non-proprietary. So the efficiency is comparable to uh, executing C code. Uh, it does have advanced equation manipulation, so you can deal uh, uh, with systems of 300,000 equations uh, easily. Uh, so the one thing I want to emphasize is that Modelica is a computer model it's a computer it's a modeling language that the computer can understand it is not a tool okay uh, so it has a textual definition to describe physical systems using uh, the uh, differential algebraic and discrete equations uh, a modelica environment a tool is needed uh, to edit and browse the modelica model graphically in form of this composition diagram, uh, which you know we call uh, we usually call schematics, but uh, it's more than that. Uh, then you need a Modelica translator uh, in order to uh, take the Modelica syntax and generate C code, which uh, can be simulated, uh, which needs to be compiled and simulated. Um, so. A Modelica environment will provide you these basic features to, to model, to edit, and to generate code, and in addition to plot and do many things. So the key here is that uh, this is a standardized language, so you can actually look at the language specification okay, without paying, and you can uh, potentially, if you participate in the Modelica uh, uh, association, you can actually modify the language also. Anyway, so that's that's the important thing that there's nothing hidden really. Uh, so uh, you have the Modelica language that is developed by the Modelica Association that is open and non-profit. Uh, to be part of the Modelica Association, you have to work for free and eventually be elected to be part of it. Uh, you cannot pay to be a member. <laughs> you have to pay once you're a member. <laughs> it's a very uh, interesting setup. And it, to stay a member, you have to contribute to the Modelica uh, language and community. It also So it provides the language. Uh, it provides the Modelica standard library that I've been showing you. And it develops other standards, such as the uh, uh, the model exchange standard called FMI that we'll cover a little bit. Uh, also, the distributed cost simulation protocol and some other standards that are, uh, are uh, sorry about that, uh, and some other standards uh, that they're developing. Uh, tools are uh, that are available. Uh, uh, that we use uh, for our research are Open Modelica, which is supported by the Open Source Modelica Consortium. And uh, it's open source, so you can just download it. And the tool that we use for most of our work really is, well, we use Open Modelica for some things that are quite useful, uh, but um, for most of our work, we use Daimola, which is, uh, a tool that was developed by Dynasim AB, but it was acquired by Dassault. And this is proprietary software. Um, so you need a license and so on. Um, the, the fact that it was acquired by Dassault is important, as you will see towards the end of the presentation. So uh, in the case of Daimola, you have a graphical editor. Or in the case of uh, working, sorry, in general, to work with Modelica, you need a graphical editor, so you can use Open Modelica, Daimola. Um, you you have a, a textual description, the language. So you have one file. You could have many files uh, if you uh, have to add uh, graphics and so on. But um, you could get away with mostly just uh, having everything in the textual definition, because some of the graphical descriptions that you see are also 
standardized in the language. So that's why you can get the same image in two tools, right? So if you see here, the Open Modelica, the example for these graphics, and the example here for uh, PID control, you see? They're almost the same thing. And that's because the way of making these uh, uh, icons is also standardized. Uh, now you could choose to be able to interpret those uh, ways of representing the graphics and then make it prettier like these guys did. So they can read it and then they make it prettier. But I mean, that's just a aesthetics perspective, but uh, you, I think you get my point. And finally, you need uh, something that allows you to translate, generate the code, and you can do either commercial or free open source. All right, so uh, I wanna uh, nail down this uh, concept very, very uh, well. So there is a difference then between physical modeling and traditional modeling that most of you are used to probably, uh, which is block oriented, uh, typically what you would do with a tool like a simile. So Modelica does a casual modeling. So it only requires you, the modeler slash developer, to define a problem at a high level, and that leaves the, solu the solution to the simulation tool. So here you have an example for a simple circuit. This is the model in Modelica. You preserve the physical structure, you do not have to figure out which is the variables that you have to solve for through a block diagram. Uh, block oriented models are procedural, so you have to define the order in which the calculations are done. In Simulink, that is done through signal flow. This is very difficult to understand if you are, a, as an electrical engineer, maybe not, but if you are out of practice, it's easier to know what's being done here than what's being done here. So that's an important concept of the differences here. So that's the value that you get out of it. So here is a, uh, uh, another example. So we need to do a multi-domain model of a controlled servo motor. So the solution with a casual modeling through Modelica is that you will go and couple components from multiple domains. So you go through electrical library, you drop a resistance, you drop an EMF, uh, then you go to the blocks library, you drop a PI controller, you connect the real output to this uh, uh, um, um, control voltage source, and then you, uh, here you have the, the DC motor inside, and you connect the, the mechanical flanges together to a gearbox and to another inertia, which is the load. And the, here you connect a sensor and you take it through as a feedback signal. If we needed to do that uh, in signal flow, in this particular example, uh, I, I, it's done with Simulink, you have to derive the realization of the block diagram. Um, so you lost the physical meaning, it's hard to understand, and the representation here is not unique. You can derive a block diagram in many ways. So that's, that's a problem, but what is even more a problem, let's say that you need to make a change. So now we want to study the relational effects. So in our object-oriented modeling approach, we can just move this uh, load to the right and add a spring damper in the middle. Whereas in signal flow, we have to add a, a, a model of a, of a flexible shaft. And that requires us to modify and break the existing model in this entire world. This is really, this example really tries to show you is that as the systems become bigger and more interconnected, doing this stuff is a nightmare versus doing this is much more easier. Okay, so coming back to the previous question, uh, it's hard to compare what runs faster, right? And the reason is because this is a completely different approach. So. Inside a Modelica tool, you will have the graphical editor, the textual editor, where you assemble a Modelica model. Uh, and that Modelica uh, tool will take the Modelica source code and do the first thing is that uh, in the tool is something called the front end that will translate the model uh, 
into a flat form means that it takes away all the object orientation. So the object orientation is really just to take advantage uh, of it for modeling. The next step is to take uh, the DAE model that you have with all of those equations and uh, analyze them, sort them, and optimize it in such a way that you arrive to a, a BLT block lower triangular form. So that's what you see here being done for that circuit. So uh, the Modelica tool has to automatically do this. And to do this, you're using results from the field of mathematics from the 1990s, okay, compared to using a traditional tool using the trapezoidal method from 1864, which is that range of years. That's kind of what we the, those tools do. So you here see now you have uh, the, the steps. Finally, once you have chosen the right equations to solve, well, not you, but the, the tool, you will generate C code and compile it. So if you want to compare uh, the performance and the tool, now you have all this chunk of things that will take some time to do. And the larger the model, the more time it will take. So you have to pay for, for, for uh, not having to handwrite all of this stuff, of course. So it will take a little longer to translate the model, but it may not take as long to simulate. Okay, because you have gen uh, generated C code with a specific solver, and there are some solvers that are very good for certain systems. So, for example, for stiff systems, uh, Diamola has different solvers to choose. So you could go um, here under simulation, and here you could choose from many, many solvers. So, for example, if you have a very stiff system, you can do, use this method called Radau. To A, which is, yeah, it's somewhere in the 90s that they made that stuff. Okay. So this gives you a, a large degree of freedom of what to choose. And as you're combining models that have different time scales, so combining an electrical circuit with a mechanical system, it normally creates the bigger the inertia you have, it creates large time constants versus fast time constants. And you end up with a very stiff system that needs to have. Uh, you need to be careful when doing that. But there is a huge advantage uh, when you compare with traditional approaches, which is here. So basically what this allows you to do is to have faster development and lower maintenance, okay? Uh, when you build these Modelica libraries of your own or, re or you reuse libraries, uh, you spend less time making models and more time reusing them um, without having to figure out the, the causality doing assignment statements. So normally, uh, so the Modelica compiler performs this causalization for you. It has to figure out how the, the problem has to be solved. Um, so uh, after the model flattens everything, uh, uh, it has a model the model description, and then it has to do something called the matching process, that is to figure out which equation is used to solve which variable. Uh, and it needs to do something called also high, um, high index uh, reduction. So at the end, you end up with a system of equations of index zero, which is normally just your differential equations of first order in block lawyer triangular form. So normally all of that stuff needs to be done by an engineer that develops the source code and then a compiler. If you're, uh, if you're used to Simulink or, or some generic tools that let you do some use certifying models, the tool, so the engineer for, that works for uh, P, PISA, P, PSCAL or whatever, they have to formulate all of this and then you provide maybe a user-defined model or you make a block diagram, it still has to generate some source code for that and link it to the main tool. So uh, at least you go from here to here, so the, uh, you depend less on this. Now with Modelica, the only thing that you have to do is to propose the equations, then the Modelica compiler has to figure out how to solve them and generate them 
executable. So um, I don't have a slide right here on, I think I deleted it, on how fast it is. I will dig it out, uh, but it's, uh, it's performing very, very competitively. Uh, let me So uh, Francesco Casella is a professor in Italy and he has this pro uh, paper. Uh, this is not that new, but it's uh, new enough. The, these things move really fast right now because of the demand from the um, automotive industry and other industries. Let's see, let's see if we can open. Ah, one thing that I really like from the Modelica community is that all of the papers are open source so we should be able to find it uh, anyway. So yeah, so here you can look at some uh, scale aspects of um, of time performance if you... Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm just gonna paste the link because I didn't really answer the question directly, but maybe this is enough to answer the question. I don't know who asked it either, but uh, if you have it, I'll, I can find you other things, but I used to have a slide that compares the the performance, but it's really, since this is a multi-engineering tool, it's really depending on what you're doing. So tools for power systems like PSSC have been developed since the 1970s, have 50 years of heuristics behind it. So even like that, we have managed to beat it with Daimola. So we are now running simulations faster than PSSC, which for a generic tool like this is amazing because they're using mathematical uh, uh, methods to solve these uh, simulation problems instead of heuristics. So I can, uh, yeah, if you want to see that paper, that one's on my GitHub. So, so uh, in this one, in some case, well, in some cases we did beat PSSC. What is it called? Uh, I don't work for the salt. I just gave them help them set up the models for this paper. So uh, I'm trying to find it. Where is the link at here? Uh, yeah. So. OK, so I'm just putting this on the link. So it, uh, ah, that's just the abstract. Sorry about that. This one? No, that we did already. the abstract, I should come here. All right, so I'll just put the link over there. So if I, yeah, if anybody has some other questions, let me, let me know. Okay, uh, so that's uh, about performance. So uh, one thing that I, I didn't show you in detail is the Modelica standard library. It's uh, it's something that all of the Modelica tools have in common and is included, is developed by the uh, Modelica Association. So in here you will have already a library of uh, many, many, many models that allows you to assemble multi-domain uh, uh, system uh, models. So you have um, for me uh, me uh, mechanical uh, systems, uh, fluid, thermal, and so on. So um, this, this is included for free. Uh, so uh, setting up a multi-domain system similar to what we have to do in Chita is really attractive with this kind of uh, technologies. So this is a little example now. Here we have the electrical machine, a DC motor. Uh, connected to the mechanical load, and the DC motor is connected to a thermal network that is uh, representing the heat for the model of that machine. And then here at the bottom, we have a cooling circuit, which is representing the cooling required for that machine. So I picked up this example because this kind of shows something of like, at least Kirua students, you probably need to do all of this stuff. And this is very attractive because you don't need to use five tools. Uh, of course, these are uh, 
what I'm showing you here are simplified models, but you can do very complex models uh, uh, of your own, like what Megan will show you. Okay. Uh, we have a few more slides on the FMI standard. So what is the FMI standard? It's, it's a sister technology to Moelica, also maintained by the Moelica Association. It originated as a European project from uh, called ACOSAR, which all the uh, European car manufacturers were involved with because they have to have many people provide them models to assemble the system. So BMW doesn't make parts. Uh, Daimler doesn't make parts. You know, they have to integrate systems. So they needed to solve this problem of exchanging models because there's 50,000 tools and they can't talk to each other. Uh, so ideally, if everybody used Modelica, you wouldn't have this problem, but a lot of people don't want to do it. So what they decided to do is that to create a standard that allows you to exchange models. So you can exchange models with all of the equations already in a specific format or to do co-simulation between uh, uh, models from different tools when exported in this way. So you can import and export models to, from two different environments. So for example, if you want to run these Modelica models in Simulink, it's a piece of cake, you go here, you have to uh, modify this model a little bit. So I think we have an example here in, in mechanics, uh, multibody, and then examples. There should be something called FMU somewhere. Maybe it's not here. Let me see. It might be in rotational. Examples. There should be one called generation of FMU or something like that. Sorry about the ah here. So here it shows you how you can represent the same model, and if you wanted to export it on FMU, you have to uh, set it up in these ways. So at the bottom here, it shows you how to decompose decompose the models in different parts. Now, if you wanted to export this model into a different tool, let's say that you don't care what the inputs of the system out, you just want to simulate it in Simulink because you love Simulink. So you could just take this model. Uh, I won't, I have to start Simulink, so that will take an eternity, but you go to here to FMU and you can choose if you want to do only model exchange, so just the equ equations, but these equations have been causalized. They have to have a direction. So you have to know what is the input and the output. Or if you want to do uh, exchange a model for uh, both model exchange and co-simulation, click OK, and it will generate a, a, a .fmu file that then you can link up into another simulation. So, uh, Megan, can you open that up for the demo so we, will, yeah. we can show that? Because I didn't tell you to do that, but you have a million of those examples. So, Megan, for example, does a lot of work on parameter estimation, so we built all of our models in in Modelic, and then we import them to MATLAB Simulink uh, to do the, the experiments with a tool that we developed. So this allows you to, to deal with these problems. Um, um, so what is co-simulation? Uh, you generate this model uh, that is causalized, and it will include a solver. So your FMU inside will have the simulation uh, um, uh, method in it and uh, so there must be a master tool that coordinates the solution of either two FMUs or the model inside of the tool and that. The one example in electrical power is uh, EMTPRV uh, which is a tool like PSCAT that allows you to do this um, and they were uh, asked to do that by EDF because EDF models all their nuclear plants using Modelica, so they want to be able to simulate the true nuclear plant together with the grid. Uh, this is very difficult to get right. Um, you have to be careful with the choices that you do. So co-simulation is very prone to numerical problems. So the, the favorite method that I have 
is with model exchange. So you exchange the equations in castellized forms, and they are important into this master's tool, for example, MATLAB Simulink or uh, Twin Builder from ANSYS or whatever. And then uh, you use the solvers available in that tool to solve the equations. So uh, the requirement is that the tool that you use has robust solvers. So something that we have to do sometimes is to import uh, Simulink models of controllers into Daimola, and that's no problem. Uh, well, it is a problem because you need a special license from another company to do that because the math works just wants to keep you locked in into the environment. So we have a tool that allows us to generate the source code in FMU form, and then we can run it in, in, in anywhere we want, basically, that supports the FMI standard. So this is the important thing that for users, Modelica and the FMI provides now a large degree of freedom where you can take your model and run it in different environments. How many of those environments well, it's now more than 130 tools. You need to go to this uh, web page. So here, there it shows, I'm having these screenshots here to show you a number of tools, but also to explain you how to interpret what tools do what. And the main reason I use Daimola is because it is the only one that has in green all of this. Okay, it supports the FMI standard the most. They're very committed to support the standards. So to look at this, so, for example, Simpler from ANSYS allows you to do model exchange uh, to import FMUs from model exchange for versions 1.2 and 2, uh, which have been uh, cross-checked past. And what this means is that the Modelica Association has a server that will check automatically if they comply with this. Everything in blue is what the vendor tells you it works, but you don't know. It hasn't been verified. Okay, so ANSI supposedly will allow you to import FMUs and do cost simulation and should allow you to do uh, to export FMUs also outside of Simpler. Now, if you look at here, uh, these ones, they say that they have plans to, put, to support. Now, 1.0 and 2.0 means the version of the standard. So uh, the most recent version uh, uh, that they are, the tools are supporting is version two. Uh, some of them don't support version one because it's too old. Uh, it's only 10 years, but they already have uh, dropped, some of them have dropped version one and version three is coming also. So if you wanna find, if your tool works, you just go to this website and I don't know if you, if you look uh, under what, uh, yeah, let me just show you this one, EMTP R RV. So this is the only one tool, but they only allow you to import models. They say they allow you to export for co-simulation, so that might be new. I need to check that. Uh, this tool called Energy Plus is very common in the building energy system domain, is to model buildings, and they allow you only to import and they say that to export, but I'm not sure about that. I haven't tested it. So, ETAS is a aerospace company. So you see, they have a lot of the tools here that you see are mostly from aerospace. If you want to do real time simulation, you have to go. Uh, for, uh, you can use this space, this collects you stuff. Uh, the other vendors are not listed yet. All right, car maker, which is very common for uh, the. Where is car maker right here? Yeah, this is very common for in the automotive domain, car maker, car sim. Mechanical engineers use CATIA, SOLIDWORKS. So you can see this is this is quickly uh, populating. You can, I think you can use LabVIEW also for some thing. Yeah. Well, it, NI is not really doing much, but there's third party tools for this. Uh, TLK, yeah. So this from TLK, uh, it supports for LiveView for uh, version one. So you can run the models with a special plugin that they have. So this is really nice because now uh, you have an open source and open access uh, standard. Uh, I mean, this is also open source because they give you all the code to integrate the FMI standard into your own tool. So uh, that's quite useful. All right. 
So I think uh, some, uh, I'm, I'm almost nearing the end of this uh, technical part or introduction to something technical. Uh, here's a very advanced use case. This is another tool called Simulation X that I didn't open it because my license it needs to uh, be updated. Um, so you see myself, I use, I'm using four tools, five actually, five Modelica tools for different purposes. So uh, uh, Simulation X is really neat for when you have to simulate conveyor belts. So I, I just testing some examples for, for that. But so here they show you how they go from the model. This is an elevator system. How do we, they export that model into this space as an FMI? They're running in the box and they're connecting the hardware of the elevator system into the box. So you can go from modeling to real time. We are here at RPI, we're working on using the Opal RT targets to do this also. There is poor support for it from Opal, so we have to do some things ourselves. So, okay. So why are uh, uh, Modelica and FMI important for uh, CPS or cyber physical systems or for our project, right? So I was very lucky to be involved in this uh, European project called OpenCPS.eu that it has finished, uh, where Saab was one of the main um, uh, industrial partners. And basically they, adopted, showed that by adopting the, the Modelic and FMI approach in the first loop or the design iteration process, uh, they were able to reduce 15% 50, uh, cost in the model development. And as they went into the different loops that they did here, uh, they found more and more uh, uh, cost reductions. Um, they also found early, uh, this uh, discovery of design errors that they had. They had to do less uh, pressure on their test rigs because now they could export models a little bit easier. So um, yeah, so you see for, for aerospace companies, this is highly attractive because these are very complicated systems. Uh, I, this is one uh, of the uh, model of the uh, electronic control, uh, the, sorry, of, of the SAV uh, system. Uh, or with the different subsystems, as you see here. Now, what you could see here is that the ECU uh, hardware block here actually was running the C code that is inside of the actual hardware, and then the inputs and outputs were mapped into the variables of that C program over here. So you can do things even like that. And uh, other things that for aerospace uh, you can do, uh, very, very neat uh, training simulators. So this is the one from uh, DLR, the German Space Agency. I just think this is super cool. That's why I always wanna show it. So to finish my part of the presentation is, what is the, the role at least of this uh, open access standards in industry? So one thing that I'm kind of trying to promote the use of this uh, in, in, in our project, but is that Boeing has signed a 30-year contract with uh, Dassault to, uh, to use the 3D experience platform. The 3D experience platform uh, is, a, um, is a whole tool suite uh, that is the interface is the web browser, but where you can, for example, do a finite element analysis and then use those results for your Daimola model. So Daimola is the tool inside of the 3DS experience that uh, Boeing will start using eventually. So uh, that's kind of why this is relevant, I guess, at least for some of you, mostly for me. And, you know, this is kind of the skills that we need to help students develop because they need to be able to use uh, architectures. So not just you know, be able to do the circuit, but think about in a general way and then do variants of that in design. Um, they specifically show here that you need to be able to use Modelica models to ensure intellectual property. Now, now that's really the business for, for companies like Boeing is that you wanna capture intellectual property in a way that is not just on paper, but is executable and uh, that can be protected. Modelica 
is open source, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be encrypted. You can encrypt your own models. Um, so yeah, so so yeah, you will. Uh, sorry, uh, I took this from my class notes. So <laughs> uh, there's also some industry needs that are relevant for anybody working in electrical power. So if you see here, uh, they don't mention Modelica, but they mention Daimola directly. And Tesla is one of the big customers of, of, uh, das, of uh, Dassault and also other Modelica companies, such as uh, Modelum. Okay. So um, you can see the jobs that they have, vehicle dynamics control engineer or fairware engineer. So a lot of this is you know, not just electrical engineering, but you have to combine control and mechanical engineering together. Mechatronics, they used to call it. I don't know what they call it now. Anyway. Uh, Boeing has a similar job that you know you need to do all of this stuff on modeling simulation. So they, they are looking for people with this kind of skills nowadays. Here's some more companies. One that is next door to you is called is Wolfram. So they are a company that develops some Modelica tool called System Modeler, and they have very talented people over there. Yeah. But most of the people that do that tool are in lean shopping in Sweden. All of this Moelica stuff started in Sweden. So that's, uh, I, I brought it from when I was a professor in, over there. So I, I'm trying to help companies here that want to use it. And you see ANSYS, for example, has a job. So it's a very ripe market, uh, market for, um, uh, that has a lot of needs for people learning this. And my job as a faculty, is just to to help companies to find these people. So I'm not going to be able to have many students. Well, this is my slides, and the last one is a, an example of the project of one of my students that took a course last semester. He did the SpaceX uh, rocket landing simulation and compared it to real data, and then he used a library in uh, a Modelica library that allows you to do this visualization. So that's his actual model that he did for a project, which okay, it doesn't have much electrical in it, but it's pretty cool. So I stop now. Is there questions that I need to cover before Megan takes over? Nothing? Okay, everybody's on mute. So if you want to say something, please unmute yourself. If you don't want to say anything, we'll just keep going. All right. So going back to the, so I, I just covered these three uh, topics in my slide set. Um, Megan will do uh, some hands-on examples and show you the potential applications. Do you want to start with this first or do you have the slides ready? Yeah, slides are here. They're All right, well, awesome. So we're going to start the other way around. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, let's start the other way okay. around. Uh, you need to become the presenter, man. Yep. I need to do that. Um, where is your here? Can you just start sharing, try? Uh, my share. Yeah, because I normally don't have any. Yeah, it lets you Wait. directly. Yes. OK. There you go. So. Okay. So you just uh, go here to present. Never present on Google. But here you can see what they're seeing. That's why I have the two. Okay. So this is Medellica and um, its application to FMI. So we have here just our how system engineering not updating. I'm no, it is updating. I was lying. Yeah, you're on the, the okay. on the wireless, so. Okay, so how all of our systems kind of work together. Um, we work with model-based design, so we have to start at the very beginning um, with getting verifying requirements, identifying our best solution, modeling and simulating potential solutions, systematically building up space for potential solutions, um, and defining top-level requirements here. So this is the, yeah engineering design uh, process for an aircraft. So we start, we start there and then we build up to get our whole airplane. So um, the whole 
purpose behind our uh, system design and engineering is we are first building a multi-domain model. Um, so this is with an aircraft example. We want to have our fuel, our airframe, our uh, actuation, actuate, actuation, secondary power, landing gears, our power plant, thermal management, all of those domains packaged up into one model. We also want to be able to have different levels of fidelity. So be able to like analyze the fuel on different levels of complexity. Um, we have to have it pretty simple on a whole system wide model since if we have detailed model, it'll slow down our simulation speed a lot. So we have to have different levels of complexity um, and be able to replace those models in, uh, immediately. Uh, and then we want to be able to analyze this in different tools. So the really nice thing about the FMI standard is we can take our models from different Medellica platforms and import them into other tools. So this is our multidisciplinary design for an aircraft. We are starting with our geometry, which feeds into the aerodynamics, the structures, propulsion, and the performance, which is defined on the system level, and it all kind of feeds back together. But because we can make it a multi-domain model, we, so yeah, here is our geometry of our aircraft um, shown there. We have a, um, in a minute, I'll show you the, aircraft dynamics library where we can actually simulate our aircraft like that shown there. Um, so Medellica in the multidisciplinary context, um, we want to be able to use FMI technologies to achieve um, efficient and the full air aircraft. Um, so we can't just do this by ourselves. We got to be able to use different tools. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all we have from here. No, you missed something. Uh, so the, the one important thing is that uh, that we have here is that uh, Modelica is not for uh, computational fluid dynamics or for finite element methods, uh, but it allows you to combine uh, these response surface models from aerospace or uh, discretize uh, PDE models. Uh, so for example, the ones that you can generate from uh, finite element tools like Abacus, for example, or something like that. So you can actually use those discretized models or the response surface models from the CFD tools, but you cannot do CFD kind of stuff or FEM kind of stuff in Modelica. It, it's, it's, it, 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 the language was not developed for that. There is some efforts to do PDEs in Modelica, but it's not in product. I mean, it's still research. So people is working on doing all of this stuff. Yeah, you, you can switch, sorry, okay. interruption. Okay, so by being able to integrate FMI into our models, we now can expand upon our um, framework for our model as well. So before we just were anal being able to analyze on the geometry, um, aerodynamics, structures, and propulsion, but now we can add in multiple domains that we can also analyze. Um, so now we're adding in thermal, electric, hydraulics, pneumatic, avionics, and performance. Um, and we're able to feedback using um, the FMI standards. So now we're able to get distribution, distributed propulsion and propulsion airframe integration because of FMI um, hybrid electric um, and turbo electric propulsion, as well as thermal management and be able to analyze those. Um, it's ideally suited for just being able to separate architecture from configuration with variant handling, as well as providing automatic equation sorting, which we can't do in other tools. So, for the next generation aircraft, we're primarily looking on these five areas for propulsion, thermal, electric, hydraulics, and pneumatics. Um, with Modelica, we can provide a system level physical model and we're partly limited by the available libraries. We already have some pretty complex libraries there, but we're going to have to be able to work up to some more complex models with Cheetah ourselves. Um, so at the, with Medellica and FMI, the full system model, we can expand upon this. Um, 
using Modelica, we can only look at a single model. By F using FMI, we can export these models to other softwares and be able to analyze in other softwares. Um, and with FMI, we can also add in co-simulation setup. So before we explained the difference between model export and co-simulation, now we can bring in our solvers from Dimola or whatever sort of Modelica software you're using and bring that into another tool for analysis as well. Um, and then we can also. Yeah. Um, now you could, this is the, would be the last step. Yeah, this would be the last step to couple with um, fluid dynamic analysis, a finite element analysis there. But as well. with the restriction that we can only do this uh, uh, RSM or, or uh, discretized PDEs. So yeah. we can get beyond the state of art simulation for our optimization, but we have to simulate everything and it can be kind of slow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the advantages of using FMI for multidisciplinary um, modeling is we can support architecture for uh, support for architecture level modeling. Um, we can build to reuse. We have a lot of libraries available. Um, I'll show on Friday how we can actually reuse our models. We can set them up as templates, make simple models that can be um, easily swapped in and out of models to um, provide varying degrees of complexity within the models. Um, it provides cost efficient deployment from desktop to the actual. Did somebody join? I believe we lost somebody, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, to the uh, system itself. Um, Adelic is a high level language, so we can use from the same source efficient code generated for optimization, simulation, and other analysis. And this can also be exported into other tools. We have a tool right now already built for our lab um, using MATLAB, which I can, you want me to show it today or Friday? You can show it today. I can show it today, I have it pulled up. Uh, and we can also do analytic sensitivities, um, can also be generated using FMI in the FMI interface is numerically efficient. So this is why Medelica is an official kind of pulled up into one slide. So we start with one model and we can export this model into um, other tools. We can do different kinds of analysis on our tool. Um, we can do transient simulation. We can do, um, it already has an algebraic equation system ready for steady state design. We can export it to other tools for design optimization or optimal control. All right. Yeah. So uh, that's where we leave off and we can start with showing our. Uh, uh, Megan, yeah. why don't you share those slides in the chat so, so okay. they can take them. Uh, where is the chat window? Okay. I've lost it. Um, you have to go up to your... There it is. On the chat. There it is. Okay. So I get the shareable link. So this was just like to give you some more specific example of the potential ways of using these standards and tools in, in Cheetah and how it really gives an opportunity to do an integrated design. Uh, that's kind of our task in the project is to do in integrated design. So we need stuff from everybody, and, uh, and we thought that we would do this telco just to try to give you some insight of why we're choosing these tools instead of using traditional stuff. So to to highlight this, uh, Megan has prepared some demos of the aircraft dynamics library. I think yeah. you they already seen this one, but go ahead. Oh, no, this is the way. Oh, is the wind size? Yeah. So, right. um, yeah. So, for, first, explain them how the model is laid out. Okay. What, what is an architecture okay. and so. On. Um. So this is the aircraft dynamics library. It's a paid library from Modelon. Um, we're going to actually be using this in our project um, to help us model the geometry and the dyna aircraft dynamic part of our um, model and be able to interface with the other proposed architectures for like the fuel and the power system and everything else. 
So the way this library is set up, we have some examples prepared. They have um, aircraft providing um, airplane airframes for a bunch of different um, aircraft. So here you can see they've got already the geometry for a Douglas DC-9, which I've found out is a really old aircraft. Yeah, but all it's, the information it's really, is available. All the information is available. So it's um, a really good example. They have a couple Airbus models um, and their geometry already laid out and modeled. Um, and some other things. So there's a bunch of examples for fuselages, tails, landing gears, all the geometry of your airframe. Um, they have the power system already lined out for this. So this is for, again, the Douglas DC-9. Um, this connects to the geometry of the aircraft. And here, clicking on all these different things, there's the fuel source modeled, um, the hydraulic system modeled, electric system, um, the engines, and that's all tied into the geometry I showed before. Um, and then they also have the systems modeled there to communicate with the power system and the geometry of the aircraft. So in here they have like the flight deck, the weights of everything, and how those controls are made. Um, so I'll just show a couple examples that they already have lined up. So this is for the wing sizing, um, wing sizing example. So we have a couple controllers just dictating how the response of the model. Um, and here's our aircraft. If we go inside, we have the geometry and the airframe that I showed before. This is connected to our power source and the systems. Um, and this all communicates to these controllers that I have here. We have a bunch of different options that we can toggle through to change the geometry of the model. It's already programmed in here using these blocks, though, to um, change just so that they can simulate the example. So here we can animate this. I already have it compiled, um, and I'll show you how to simulate models on Friday. But here they, it's running. Oh, yeah. Um, those pins that I showed before toggle, and they change the wing dimensions and the fuselage dimensions. Um, of the aircraft. Can you walk through with the diagram? Um, yeah. Diagram. Yeah. Uh, put them side by side. Okay. Animation. Okay. You should show the sliders. I think the thing just finished. Okay. Wait. Wait. okay. Um, no, it does not show sliders moving. What? Okay, you can hide it. Okay, so that's that example. Um, and then there's also a flight maneuver sample, um, which just shows, yeah. Um, this is the example of a DC-9 aircraft controlled by an autopilot. So it has, um, Kind of awkward to show. Excuse me. All right, let's see. Here it is. So we have our aircraft here. Go to view. Uh, sorry. Go to window view. No, you can get to go to animation. Uh, 3D view control. There you can uh, move it around the easier okay. okay okay so what it does is let's see if it will no this one's not that nice okay but you can see the aircraft click on control and hold control while you rotate it okay, it's difficult it. yeah oh there it is didn't really change anything. Um, the plane is on autopilot and moving away from me, and I'm dragging it with it, so it's going to leave the screen. But you can try and do it. It's a really awkward one to try and you're zoomed into the plane. This is in that. It left the screen. Yeah, 
Yeah, there it is. One thing is that you might need uh, uh, a big screen to see some of these things. Yeah, you can really see it better on. Okay. There you go. It's turned flipped around. Is it? Yeah, it's upside down. There. There. Okay. There. Okay. See, now this guy's on autopilot. His whole flight path was being recorded now that we reset. There we go. Yeah, you have to it's select. Like you have to select a body, but you can see the flight path being recorded. And the guy's on autopilot, which is a fun time. Um, you already showed the landing one, so I won't show that one. Um, and then this one is an example from just showing the aircraft and how we can maneuver the um, aircraft. So this is just mostly focusing on the airframe and how we can just rotate the airframe. Um, so it's the same kind of setup as before. There's a controller being fed in there with a connection to the geometry of the aircraft. Um, when we and it oh, no animate that we have our aircraft there i'll rotate it so you can get a better view um and it mostly just focuses on us changing the coordinate system down there the aircraft all right all right um so if if you guys want to unmute yourselves and have any questions, I guess yeah. that will be it for today. Well, then I have the rapid stuff if we want to show. Oh, that. you want to show the Do you want to stuff? Show it? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Um, and just a little like explanation on how the FMI stuff works. Uh, we have a tool in MATLAB that we call RAPID, which stands for Rapid Parameter Identification, um, which allows us to export a model. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Which allows us to export a model in um, from Dimola or any kind of Medelica tool into MATLAB to be analyzed using Simulink. Oh, there you go. Okay. So this is the one of the examples we have in Rapid. Um, I can show. It's just a simple model that we have in here. Let's see. It might be actually an electrical. Okay, so this is just a Cower low pass analog filter. Um, this is one of the examples from the Medelica standard library that we have already set up as an example in Rapid. We're able to export this as an FMU. So in the simulation setup, you can define what FMU you want to do. Um, make the different parameters that you want to apply to it and where you want to save it to. And then we export that FMU and it can be loaded into MATLAB. Um, there's already a library to do this and simulate things in MATLAB. So you can put that in as a block. I think you there is one without a license that you can use. Yeah. I'm not using it though. No, this is it's the same thing, but it'll be nice for the folks that want to use simulating still. Um, and then you load your file as an FMU. This is already loaded. And then you're able to press play and simulate. Um, our program allows the functionality to take in a set of parameters that we want to define and then optimize those based off of a set of reference inputs. Um, and different tools do similar things, but this is like an example of FMI export and why we can use it and how it can be helpful. Okay. It's good. All right. Do you guys, anybody wants to ask some questions or should we close the meeting? Is there any, anyone? Hello? Everybody's muted. I see you, you said on Friday uh, you're going to show us um, some more modeling examples. 
Yeah, so I have. So uh, we we have. So the right now it's almost two. Uh, uh, on Friday, since we had two time slots available, we took them. So we uh, we have prepared all of these examples uh, um, for next yeah. Friday. Yeah, Friday do dives a little bit deeper into like the technicalities of Medelica. So there will be an example on how we can set up models for multi-domain modeling, um, developing the interfaces, how equation-based modeling works, um, et cetera. Those are the same slides from one of our, um, or similar slides from one of our cheetah meetings yeah. about a month ago. Um, and then we have, we've been developing a model of a Boeing 747 electrical system, um, and which provides an example for templates, reconfigurable models. It uses different levels of complexity that we can use. Um, so I'll show that. And then um, Karuba's group show, made a power system, um, a preliminary power system. We put that into our Cheetah library, and I'll be showing that. And that has some very. Do, do you have them then, just to give them a preview? Yeah. Let's open. Uh, here is that. Um, here I have open already our Boeing 747 system. This so the, the, this how, one gives an example of architecture. So, yeah, so. so you see here we have the, those icons that you see are sunken. And what that allows you to do is to um, um, be, add, be able to uh, change the whatever is inside of that block to change it for different options. Yeah. So then we can change between different loads and generation um, with different varying levels of complexity or whatever you want to do. Show them what's inside of, of, of uh, one of the blocks, for example. Of this? Yeah. Okay. So this is just nothing. Uh, <laughs> that's just nothing because that's just the replaceable model. But um, for like the generator that we have, um, this is, yeah, the synchronous generator for Boeing 747. We have our generator, um, an electrically excited machine. Um, we have an AVR modeled and all the conversions um, being pulled in there. We have a. Where is it now? Uh, okay. So you, you can see here, even this one is sunken, which is, means that it can be replaced by something else. It's not showing. Uh, it's not showing. It's There's not a mistake. It's, uh, it's a mistake. <laughs> it's from a different library. That's not yeah. Totally put over but here. I think, well, anyway, there, uh, she, it, this is work in progress, anyway, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but there should be. Uh, Okay, so this is, has another type of controller, you see, and when you go in there, you have you have the schematic. The whole transfer so you could just with a right click just change the model uh, variant that you have. So you can evaluate the the machine with a different type of control uh, excitation controls, for example. Okay. And then for the cheetah electrical system, um, this is just with varying. That was just for. Testing. Yeah. But yeah, this is with varying degrees of complexity. We start with just regular power electronics to have on the far left, we have our fuel source, which is just modeled as a fuel planet. It's supposed to be a fuel cell, but I have it modeled as just a simple but it, fuel This cell. comes from a template or what? No, no. I'm just duplicating. So it's just two um, constant voltages with an impedance tied into it, feeding into um, some converters, yeah, and we have our like HTC or HTS that, line. Yeah, and this is a DC to DC converter. Yep, this is a DC to DC converter. So you see, it's being modeled with the actual switches, yep. right? But we have also she has also made models that has just the average models. Yep. So in here, that's not average. It's, that's it's not average. DC. Ah, this one is average. Yep. So you can combine modeling approaches. You see here inside, we just have a, a, a an average model for the switch. Yeah. You see? <laughs> yeah. So it just, we have it set up with varying levels of complexity. Um, and the drone. The drone's not loaded right now. Okay. So, but that gives you a little preview of what we will cover in the next uh, uh, day. Yep. I mean, the, the idea with this uh, webinars is just to give you a, a kind of an overview of things that we are doing. Um, 
I mean, if you guys are really interested after the next webinar, uh, it, the learning curve is quite high with this thing. So I actually teach a whole semester course on, on modeling and simulation using these tools. But I have taught in the past a one week intensive 40 hour class that gets you like about 30% of the contents of my class, 40%, which is enough to, to be independent more or less. So uh, we, I mean, let's see after the other webinar, if you guys are interested, we can uh, talk with Phil, Professor Phil and Professor Kirua. Any other questions? I think that's it. Uh, thank you for the presentation. We'll see you guys on Friday. Okay. All right, Sounds great. Good. I will send a link with the recording when this, uh, once it's available to send it, to, uh, you guys can send it to everybody in, uh, I don't know if anybody from Phil's group uh, uh, came over, but um, please make it available to all the Illinois people because you have many teams, so it will be useful to to share it with everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. Just uh, send me the recording and I'll share it with everyone. What's your email? Uh, my e email is, uh, I'll type it into the chat message. Perfect. Okay. All right, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And uh, see you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye. Copy this, it's not.